Have you ever been watching a tutorial and then been amazed when a developer uses some really cool feature of JavaScript you've never seen before? That's happened to me so many times. So in this video, I want to share my five favorite features of JavaScript that almost no one knows about, but they drastically change the way that I write code and the way that you'll write code. And my favorite of these features I'm going to share with you at the very end, it's something I use in literally every single JavaScript project. So let's get started now. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name is Kyle, and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. So if that sounds interesting, make sure you subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this. Now this very first feature that I wanna talk about, first I need to explain the code we're using here. It's just a super simple function called calculate price. It takes in a price, it takes in taxes, which is a percentage, so we have 0.07 for 7%, and a description of the item, and then it calculates the total with those taxes, and then it prints out the description with taxes, and then it prints out the total here as well. And as you can see, it says my item with tax is $107 because it's that 7% that tax added on to the price. Pretty straightforward and easy to use. Now, what happens if, for example, you want to allow certain default values to be passed in? So let's say we have calculate price and we call calculate price. We call it with 100, but this time we call it with zero for the taxes and we'll say my other item. Then we're going to call this another time. And for example, we're going to put undefined in here. So we're going to say my undefined item. And this would happen a lot of times if you have like an undefined value going here. Let's just put undefined for both of these actually. So this is really common. You could accidentally pass in a variable. The variable value is set to undefined. And inside your code, you need to make sure you handle that. So generally the way that people do this is they'll say, you know, taxes is going to be equal to taxes or it's going to be equal to a default, which in our case would be like 0% taxes. Actually, let's say that the taxes by default are going to be 5%. And then we could have a description here. So we could say description is equal to description or, and then we're going to have default item. So all that this does is it says, if this is some kind of false value, we'll default to 5%. And here, if this is some kind of false value, we'll default to the default item. And we can even pass in like an empty string here, for example. So if we save this, we're going to notice something interesting. Here we have my item with tax 107, that's correct, this should print 107. Here we have 100, the tax is zero, and it says my other item. But you'll notice a 5% tax is added, the price is 105. And then down here, this properly says default item with tax, and it chooses that default tax of 105. But the issue here is that up here, where we have this zero, zero is a false value technically in JavaScript. So when we use the or symbol here, it's saying zero or, and zero is false, so it uses this second value. This is a problem if we want to pass something like zero, or if we want to pass an empty string, we don't actually want it to fall back to these default values. So luckily in JavaScript, they added a new thing called nullish coalescing. And all this is, is you take anywhere that you have this like or syntax and just replace it with double question marks. And it looks a little strange because you're not used to seeing question marks in JavaScript, but these question marks work a little bit differently. It says, is this first value taxes null or undefined? If so, it uses the second value. Otherwise, it just uses the original value for taxes. So now when I save this, you're gonna notice immediately, we get this printing out just like before. But this second item now properly prints out 100 because we passed a tax as zero. And since zero is neither null nor undefined, it is just sticking with zero. This only comes into effect, these question marks only come into effect if the value is zero. And then down here, since we passed an empty string, an empty string is not a null or undefined value. So it's not going to use this fallback. So it just has empty string. And then the tax is going to the fallback value because we passed undefined. Normally, if you wanted to do this inside of JavaScript, you need to say if taxes equals null, then taxes equals 0.05. This does the exact same thing as this line down here. So technically, we could write this and that would work fine. Or we could go with this example down here and it's just much more condensed. And it allows you to write code where you would normally just have that or syntax and instead replace it with a double question mark. It's just easier to use and much better in my opinion. Now, unfortunately, this is not quite at 100% support. It's just edging itself up there. It's in a lot of the newer browsers. It's in like Google Chrome, Firefox, Edge, Safari. It's in pretty much everything, but there may be a few browsers you find that don't quite support this double question mark syntax because it is fairly new. But for the most part, you're not gonna have any issues. As you can see, it's working just fine in Google Chrome for me. Now, while we have the same code up, I want to talk about my second crazy cool feature, which is how you can style out console logs. You can take console logs, which are kind of boring and static, and actually apply CSS styling to them. And it's super simple. All you do is you add a percent %c before the text that you want to style, and then you pass a second property to your console log, which is going to be your CSS styles. 
So I could say like font weight, whoops, weight bold. Now when I save, you can see that my text is now bold. I could also come in here and just say color bold. I'm sorry, color red. And now I'm gonna have red bold text right here. So we can use literally any CSS we want to change how our console log outputs, which is super useful. And if we want to reset it, for example, if we wanna bold this first section, so we'll say we wanna bold this, and then the second section we don't want bolded, we just put another percent %c, pass another property, and now whatever we put inside of the second string is gonna be the style for everything after our second percent %c. So let's just say color green, for example. Now you can see that this text over here is bolded, and then this text is green because it's matching this selector down here. So everything after the percent %c is styled in the order that you put it. So our first percent %c goes with this style, second one goes with the second style, and so on. You can do as many as you want. And if you wanna just reset your CSS, we could just do percent %c, pass in nothing, and it's just gonna reset us to normal CSS. So now we have bold here, and then normal CSS here. We can even make it a little bit better. We could say font size is gonna be 1.5 REM, now you can see we have this really big text and this really little text down here. So you can do a ton of styling with CSS inside of just console log, which is really great if you wanna do a bunch of extra debugging work. It's super useful to be able to use these percent %c symbols. Now this next feature I wanna talk about is very similar to nullish coalescing, but a hundred times more useful in my opinion. So let's take, for example, this really simple code. We have a person class, which takes a name, an address, and a list of hobbies. And then also we have a print function, which just logs out that person. And then we have this other function called print person street, which just takes in a person, gets their street from the address and prints it. And then down here, we've created a person that has a name Kyle, an address with the street 12345 Main Street, the city somewhere, and then hobbies of bowling and weightlifting. We print that person out and we print their street. As you can see, we printed out the person object and we printed out their street. Everything works just fine. What happens if we don't have a street or we don't have an address object? Let's say, for example, we pass in undefined here is the address. We just don't have an address. Well, now when we save this, we're going to get an error because it's trying to access this address.street, but street doesn't exist. So it's saying cannot read property street of undefined because address is undefined. If we go even one step further and instead of passing an actual person in here, we pass in undefined, we're going to get another error because person's undefined and now it can't access address. This is a huge problem in JavaScript that you're going to run into all the time. So many times you may see code that looks like this. You'll see person and person.address and person.address.street, then we'll print it out. So we'll take console log, put it up here. And now this is going to work. It's just gonna print out undefined. And that's because we're first saying, do we have a person? If so, do we have an address on that person? If so, get the actual street. Otherwise, just return undefined because this is undefined. So it's gonna exit out of this you know, short circuiting right here. This is what you would normally do. You could also do something like if person and person dot address, then you could say console dot log person dot address dot street like this. This is gonna be a very similar code, not quite the same because it doesn't actually print, but it's very similar. It's making sure we check first to see a person exists and an address exists before we try to access it. This is a huge problem in JavaScript you're gonna run into all the time. And both of these ways to do this suck. It sucks to write out this if, it sucks to write out this huge and statement. So luckily, JavaScript added an easier way to do this, and it's something called optional chaining. So let's go back a little bit to where we had our original example with the clean looking code. If we didn't have to worry about null, our code would just say person.address.street, but obviously this doesn't work. So what we need to do is put a question mark in here right before the period on both of these. And now if we save, you can see it prints out undefined and doesn't throw an error. But you're probably thinking this is some crazy looking syntax. All this is saying, by doing question mark and then something, is it saying, does person exist? If person exists, as in it's not null and it's not undefined, then continue. Now we're checking, does address exist? Same thing, is it null or undefined? If it's not, then go to the street and we print out the street. But if anywhere along this chain, we have a undefined object, for example, here, person is undefined, it's just gonna stop right there. It's gonna pretend that none of the rest of this existed and it's just gonna print out undefined. So here, if we pass in Kyle, again, it's going to print out undefined because person exists, but our address is undefined. And now if we pass in an address that has a street, and we'll just say something like that. Now you can see it prints out that street because the street actually exists. It goes all the way through the chain, checking each time, does this thing exist? If so, continue on to the next one until it finds either the end of the chain or something that doesn't exist and exit out immediately. This prevents us from running into all those errors 
where you have, you know, undefined, can't call this object on undefined and so on, something you run into all the time, you don't have to worry about if you're using this optional chaining. And luckily this optional chaining can be used on things even beyond just trying to call properties. It can be used even on functions. So let's just say here, right now we're calling kyle.print and that works just fine. But let's say that we thought we had another function called print name and we wanted to call print name. Well, if we save, we're gonna get an error, of course. Uncaught type error, print name is not a function because there is no print name function on our person object. But let's just say we didn't know if this existed or not. What we could do is just say question mark period, which looks really, really weird. But now if we save, you'll notice it works just fine. Because what this code does is it's saying, okay, here's Kyle, we're calling print name, but by putting question mark period before we actually put the parentheses, it's saying check first to see if print name not only exists, but also to check if print name is a function. If print name exists and is a function, then we're gonna call it. If it's not existing at all, then we're just gonna return undefined and do nothing. So if we were to use the print function here, you're gonna notice it prints out just fine as we have our print up here, but that's because this exists. So when it does the question mark period check, it says, okay, print is a function and it exists, so let's call it. But when we had something like print name, which doesn't exist, you can see it no longer calls that because print name doesn't actually exist anywhere. This is really useful if you have an object and you don't know if certain things on that object exist, but you still want to interact with it, you can use this question mark period syntax. It also even works with arrays. So let's just say here, instead of passing a list of hobbies, we don't. So we'll come in here, we'll remove our list of hobbies. So now our hobbies are completely empty. So if we say kyle.hobbies of zero, and I wanna console log that to get the first hobby that Kyle has, I'm gonna get an error because it's saying cannot read property zero of undefined because hobbies is undefined. Well, again, you can use question mark period, just like that. And now all of a sudden it's printing out undefined because it's saying, okay, does this hobbies exist? And is it an array? If so, then we're going to access it with the array accessor. Otherwise, we're just going to return undefined and continue onward. So we could even take this a step further by, for example, here saying dot two lower case, just like that. Now, if we save, you can see it's just printing out undefined. But if we put in a list of hobbies, we'll just say, for example, bowling as the first hobby, and we save, you can now see it's accessed the first hobby correctly and it converted it to lowercase and printed that out right here. This feature is probably one of my favorite features that have been added to JavaScript recently. And luckily the browser support is pretty good. It's very similar to Nullish Coalescing that came out around the same time. Most browsers support it, but you may run into some edge cases on some less popular or older browsers. Just check to make sure, but for the most part, you shouldn't have to worry about this. Now, the next thing that I wanna talk about is something that's really simple and really small, but it drastically cleans up the speed that you can write your code. So let's just say we have a variable name, which is equal to Kyle. And we're gonna have here, let's just say favorite food. We'll set that equal to rice. And then we're gonna create a Kyle object. And this Kyle object is gonna have a name and it's gonna have a favorite food, which is gonna be set to favorite food, just like that. And we'll say console.log, whoops, console dot log Kyle. And if we come over here, you can see name, Kyle, favorite food, rice. Well, that's all good, but you'll notice that this name is the same as the name over here, and favorite food is the same as favorite food over here. The key of our object is the exact same as the name of the variable we're setting that to. Well, what you can do is just type name, or you could type favorite food. And now if I click save, you're gonna notice it works exactly the same. You can see our name is set to Kyle, and our favorite food is set to rice. And you can ignore this you know, crossed out line. I don't know why this is doing this. We just change this to like name two, maybe it'll get rid of it. There we go. Same exact thing. What you'll notice though, is that if we have an object and we wanna set a key and the value that we're setting to that has the exact same name. So we have a variable with the same exact name as the actual key we're setting it to. We can pipe just the variable name and it'll automatically convert this to the same code as if we had put the name here of the key and the variable like that. So it's essentially an object shorthand where we can just write out the variable name and it'll convert that to this key of the same name and set the value from that variable. So as you can see here, name two is set to Kyle and favorite food is set to rice. If we call this favorite food with a bunch of numbers at the end, and we, of course, make sure we copy this down here, you can now see favorite food with a bunch of numbers is set to rice. But if we wanted to have a different name, we could just say favorite food like this and make sure that that is a colon. And now you can see favorite food has been set to that variable. This only works if the variable has the same name as the key in the object, but very often this happens. So it's a great way for you to be able to save characters by just, for example, having this favorite food here and having a favorite food here. It just saves you a bunch of space and makes your code a little bit cleaner. 
Now, the last thing that I want to talk about is the most important and my favorite feature by far, and that's how you can actually load your JavaScript. So let's come in here and let's just inside of our body, we'll just create a button. And this button is just going to have some text inside of it. And it's just going to say hi. So we have a button on our screen. So let's just open this up here so we can actually see it. We'll say open with live server. Let me drag this over. And as you can see, we just have a button that says hi on it. And now inside of our JavaScript, let's just say, you know, const button equals document dot free selector of button. We can even just console log button. Actually, instead of console logging, we'll just say button dot style dot background color equals green. There we go. Make sure I have a quote. There we go. So now you should see our background color has changed to green. Works just fine. And the only reason that this works, you'll notice our script is up in our head, which normally is bad. You shouldn't put your JavaScript scripts in the head because it means that your JavaScript is loading before the body. But you'll notice in our instance, this isn't a problem. And that's because we're using this tag called defer. We're deferring our script, which means that our script is making sure our entire body loads before running any of our JavaScript. If we remove this, you can notice our button doesn't actually turn green. And instead, we actually have an error, cannot read property style of null. And that's because what's happening is when we get to our script tag, it stops parsing all of the rest of our HTML, goes into our script tag, runs the code, and then it continues parsing, which means the button never got added to our page. But by putting defer in here, what happens is it gets the script tag, it downloads it, but then it continues rendering out everything. So it renders our button. And then as soon as it's done rendering the entire page, then we run the code inside of our script. A lot of times to get around this, what people would do is they'll put the script at the bottom and then you get rid of the defer tag. And then this will also work just as well. But the issue with this is the download for your script tag doesn't start until the browser gets to it. So since it's the last thing in your browser, the very last line, it's the last thing to download, which means it could slow down your download speeds. I actually have an entire video covering this topic you can check out in the cards and description down below. It really explains this in great depth. But by just putting your JavaScript up here in the head and making sure you put defer, it means you never have to worry about waiting for DOM events for load or on ready. You also don't have to worry about the annoyingness of putting your JavaScript at the end of your body because it's just kind of difficult and painful. You have everything you need right in the head. All you have to do is defer it and it does the exact same thing as if you put your script at the very bottom, but it'll load even faster. This is something I do in literally every single one of my JavaScript tutorials because it just makes writing JavaScript that much easier and I highly recommend you do the same thing. If you enjoyed these crazy JavaScript features and want to learn even more about JavaScript, make sure to check out my full JavaScript course linked in the description. Also, I have an incomplete web development roadmap linked in the description as well, which includes a bunch of different JavaScript topics that I think are important for you to learn. So with that said, I really hope you enjoyed this video and have a great day.